Wolfgang Janus Institute, a leadership and organizational effectiveness consulting organization in Cupertino, California. Uh, Mr. Lee and his associates deliver leadership effectiveness, um, actually, I'm sorry, leadership development, team effectiveness, organizational change, and corporate culture programs and services to clients throughout the U.S. So please help me welcome Mr. Min Lee.
So I looked at this gentleman, he was sitting about right here, right here. And I jumped down from the stage and I went over and I grabbed his hand and I said, thank you very much for staying to the very end. And he said, not at all, I'm the next speaker. <laughs> I want to apologize in advance to whoever this afternoon has to speak after me. Okay? Now, we're going to have until 4.30, and we're going to do a little bit of work together on the nature of leadership. And uh, this is a field that I have been studying ever since, actually before most of you were even born. And uh, I, don't, I still don't feel like I know very much. In fact, I want to establish an agreement with you. This afternoon, none of us will know more than any others. But what we'll attempt to do is learn from one another. Okay? So I'm actually going to get off the stage and uh, just talk to you a little bit about this. I want to find out a little bit about you. How many here, if you could raise your hands, are in a leadership role right now? in the organization. Okay? So, what, about a third of you are in a leadership role in a student organization of some type, right? Okay? So, how many, could you raise your hands, you're not in a leadership role? Okay. okay. Uh, but obviously you're here because you're interested in the topic of leadership, right? So, would you raise your hand if you have no interest in leadership, no interest in what I have to say, but you're just here because it looks like a fun place. And you can meet girls. And... <laughs> okay. Alright. So, uh, there's a uh, handout in front of you, and uh, it's about treating emotional viruses in organizations. And right now, I would just like for you to have it and just put it aside, and we'll come back to it later. All right? What I want to do is, before I give you too much propaganda, um, I want to find out already what you know about leadership, even before you came into the room this afternoon. And I think it's pretty substantial. So this is an exercise called Leaders I Have Known. And if you need to close your eyes to do this, that's fine if it helps. But what I want you to do is think about all of the people who ever had control or influence over you in your life. Right? From the first moment, they must have been your parents, maybe your grandparents, older brothers and sisters, maybe aunts and uncles, maybe uh, ministers, or priests, or rabbis, or maybe school teachers, maybe principals, maybe counselors at school. Uh, maybe if you've been in sports, then they might have been your coaches, your assistant coaches, your sporting team captains. Um, if you worked part-time or full-time, then you might have had a supervisor team leader, uh, a manager, you might have known an executive, a general manager, uh, you might have had a mentor, a teacher, a professor, okay? So this is a pretty long list I want you to think about, okay? And recognize that each and every one of these people are still active and alive inside your head, right now. They're all still in there. So would you take a moment, think about all of these people, and using your own criteria, would you select whoever you believe is the very best leader you've ever had? Okay? This is your best leader. Let's call this person A, because A is the first letter of the alphabet. This is your best leader ever. Keep that person in your mind. Okay? This is a person you've been very grateful to. This is a person who's been a role model for your life. This is a person you would like to be more like all the time. Now, would you also pick out from that long list of people 
the very worst leader you've ever had. Yeah, I know, it's Friday afternoon, you prefer not to have to think of that person. But just for the benefit of the exercise, think about that person for a moment. Let's refer to that person as your Z leader. Okay? You there? Okay. In the back of the handout, maybe there's a, a little bit of uh, paper at the uh, bottom of the page. So would you take a few, a couple of minutes, and would you write down three most memorable characteristics of your A leader. And then also write down three feelings that you have now when you think about A. When you're done with that, write down three most memorable characteristics of your Z leader. And then also write down how you feel now when you think about Z. So take about two, two and a half minutes to do that, would you? And, and look up so I know what you're done. up already, but uh, let me just give you another 20 seconds or so to complete the exercise. This is very important. Great 
Great speaker. Well, my great leader was that, that way too. How about this table? What was one characteristic for your A leader? Anybody? What? Composed. Like somebody who's calm and composed, right? Alright. How about from this table? Understanding. Somebody who's understanding. Consistent. 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 Excellent. How about you guys? Risk taker. What? Risk taker. Great speaker? Risk, Risk taker. Risk taker. Risk taker. Thank you. Open mind. Open mind. Outspoken. Outspoken. Nurturing. Nurturing. Resilient. Resilient. That's a good one. And how about just one more?
Thankful. 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 Okay. How about this group? Inspired. Inspired. That's a that's a nice feeling. Thank you. How about this group? Right. 
might be bad news. Maybe good news. Maybe good news. Maybe good news.
What else? Do you feel impartial? Uh, tell me a little more about that. Yeah. Oh, okay. So you feel like neutral about that person. Yeah, you sort of turn off your feelings about that person, right? Okay. It's, all, it's like a good defense mechanism to think of them like they're just a thing. Right? Like the wind or you know, the terrain or whatever. Okay. What else? Yes, ma'am. You feel abandoned? That's a terrible feeling, yes. That's right. Let be no longer. Right? Glad that Z is no longer in your life. Yes? Discriminating.
because you are professional and you've got people depending on you. And the two voices in my head had an argument for a fraction of a second. And guess which one won? I got up. Right? You have these conversations with yourself all the time, right? Isn't that interesting that a human being is this creature that can have an argument with itself, that can love itself or hate itself, that can even be aware of itself thinking about itself. Yes, we have a definite relationship with ourselves because we have self-awareness. So personal leadership, leading oneself, is actually a very important topic. Right? Most of what we're going to talk about this afternoon is in that category. Who else do we lead? We lead our friends. Notice that we can't hire our friends and fire them and we don't have formal power over them and there's no law that says they have to listen to what we do. But some of us have this wonderful ability to get our friends to do what we want. And some are very frustrated because they can't get their friends to do what they want. Bell Laboratories, about two and a half decades ago, went through this experience. Bell Labs used to be very proud of the fact that they had, they had, they had hired the most number of PhDs compared to any other company. They had more PhDs than any other company. Okay? And they discovered that only some of their PhDs were very effective. The rest were not. Now, PhDs are supposed to be highly educated, very smart, right? You've got to have high IQ. You've got to have good grades and all of that to get a high level degree like that. And yet some of them were not very effective. So they brought in more researchers, more PhDs, to study these PhDs. Okay? And they discovered something fascinating. They discovered that the highly effective PhDs, whenever they sent out a request for information, a memo, or, you know, back in those days they also had uh, the early version of email, these people would get responses back from the organization very quickly, just like that. Within a few hours, within a day or two, they get information back. Right? And then they went and studied the not so effective PhDs. And they discovered that these people would send out a request for information, and they would sit around and wait for days or weeks. And months may go by before they hear anything back. And so the researchers concluded that our success in life depends also on whether you have good social skills, how, how much leadership effectiveness you have over your friends. Who else do we lead? Yeah. Siblings. Your siblings. Someone already said that. <laughs> Your pets. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> By the way, people who love their pets consider their pets like their children. Right? Yeah. Let me ask you something. Do you lead your parents? <laughs> See how fast that is? <laughs> so some of you are very, very skilled at knowing how to manage the mood of your parents, knowing when is the right time to ask them for something, knowing just the right way to talk to them to get exactly what you need. Okay? And others may feel some frustration about it because somehow their parents are not that easy to leave. Right? Now, some of you have worked part-time or full-time or whatever. Do you need your bosses? Yeah. 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 You do. That's called leading up. That's about knowing what the boss is all about. Knowing their values, their emotions, their motivations, knowing how to get them to do exactly what you 
need them to do. At this very moment, I am leading me. You ever been a teacher or a speaker or a lecturer? Let me tell you a story. Remember BS student? Right? Behavior science, right? BS Skinner used to say that with the right kind of reinforcement, you could get people to do anything, right? So his freshman class one day decided that they were going to train him in a period of 50 minutes to lecture only from one side of the room, on this side. Okay? And they determined that by the end of the hour, he would never wander over here anymore. You know how they did that? Completely without his knowledge. Every time he wanders over to the proper side of the room, they would sit up. They would maintain eye contact. They would laugh at his stupid jokes. <laughs> they would take, you know, serious notes as though he's the greatest source of wisdom in the world. You know how to do that, right? Why some of you are doing that now? Nah, you're training me. And every time he wanders over to the wrong side of the room, what do they do? They fall asleep in their chair. <laughs> they throw bits of paper at one another. They would whisper things in each other's ears. They would look out the window. They would daydream, play with their cell phone, whatever. No, they didn't have cell phones in those days. Okay? But you also know how to do that, don't you? See, there's a gentleman right now training me not to go over to this side of the room. He falls asleep whenever I go to that side. But look, I go to the proper side of the room and he gets up. Okay? And you know what? They did that and they got him trained. And by the end of the hour, he lectured mostly in that side of the room. Once in a while, he wanders over here, but for a mysterious reason, he very quickly hurries back. He has no idea they were doing this to him. So can you train people to do things without their knowledge? Yes. Yes. Good. So you have an influence. You have a leadership role with everybody that you come into contact with. Okay? So, um, the work that I do focuses on helping people with <coughs> themselves what I call personal mastery, then being a positive influence in other people, that's called winning hearts and minds, then supervising people, which is, a, which is the positive influence, but this time you also have the formal authority. You can actually hire someone or fire someone, promote someone or demote someone, you can discipline them, you can penalize them. And by the way, parenting, young children, is very much like that. It's a form of supervisory leadership. Then we also have people at the top of organizations. They are executives. And they're dealing with organizational leadership, which is the very difficult task of balancing the needs of their multiple stakeholders. So if you're running a company, what does your customer want? We have the customer one, lower price and better service. What do your employees want? Higher pay and less work. Those needs by the stakeholders are in conflict. It's your job to resolve those conflicts. Okay? Now, the chart says leadership develops from the inside out. That's a principle. A principle is a rule that has been proven over and over again. And to test the principle, all you have to do is think. If I neglect or ignore or violate the principle, what happens? Okay. So let's say if I put all of my focus on the outer circle, on becoming famous, or becoming greatly admired by other people, or, you know, winning public offices. Okay, that's where all of my focus is. The glory and the fame of leading other people. But then in the innermost circle of my life, I have seriously unresolved issues. I have dark shadows. I have even demons driving me. What are the consequences of that way of life? 
What will happen to me? So you open up the newspaper and you see a scandal where some executive or politician is forced to resign in disgrace. What usually happens? They are usually very successful in the outer circles, yes? But something unresolved, some dark shadow in the inner circle has finally come out and bitten them in the rear end, right? So when a representative of the House of Representatives tearfully on television admits to taking bribes, Right? and cries as he submits his resignation and begs for, to the people for the forgiveness. Okay? The failure happens in the inner circle. Okay? So, this is a very, very important principle. Now, this is a, another very important principle. I was just talking with the uh, director this morning of one of the major airports in the Bay Area, and he was talking to me about how challenging it is to motivate people. And I went over this model with him, and I said, look, motivation depends on two other forces that you've got to have under control. One is, any, you can motivate me to do anything that you want as long as you understand my value. And my values are anything that is most important to me. So if you understand my values, you can motivate me. Because you can predict what feelings I'm going to have when those values are activated. And you can also predict which way I'm going to move. So you can actually motivate me to work harder, you can motivate me to sacrifice my well-being, you can even motivate me to become a suicide bomber, if you understand my value. Okay. So, not too long ago, I was asked by a Silicon Valley high-tech company that had just had an IPO, and they had gone past their lockout period, so the original 12 founders have now been able to cast in their stock options, and every one of them had achieved their dream, which was to become a multi-millionaire, to have more money than they could ever possibly spend. And the next day, the president called me up, and he says, I'm deeply worried. What do you think he's worried about? Their motivation to work. He's afraid it's gone out the window. Right? Because for four or five years, these people have been working 80 and 90 hours a week, neglecting their health, their family, and they did all of this in order to become rich. And now they are rich. So he says to me, how do you continue to motivate these guys? Isn't that an interesting problem? What would you tell them? Is it hopeless? No. So what I said is, as I gave him this model, and I said, look, if you want to motivate these people, understand their values, and values are personal. Right? So what is most important to you may be different than what's most important to me. So I said, talk to each of them personally, and find out what they value. Does that make sense? So, for example, he and I talked to a young man about 28, 29 years old. He's not married. Uh, he doesn't really have much of a social life, but he loves technology. And he said to me, and his president, he says, I love new stuff. Don't ever make me maintain other people's stuff. I'm strictly a version 1.0 kind of guy. Okay? So, the answer is very simple. The president gave him a new title. His job is now director in charge of new stuff. <laughs> okay? And he's highly motivated and he works even harder than before. And, you know, looking at him, you, 
you can hardly believe that he's got eight or ten million dollars in the bank. Doesn't care. He just loves to do stuff. You with me? So if you can understand someone's values, you can motivate them very well. Okay? Not everybody motivates the same way. So you've got to like be willing to talk to people and find out what's important to them. Alright? And then keep this in mind as we look at this model. This is called the energies dimension and it's in that handout that you have. Except that someone made an error and put it on the back of the back page. Okay? And try to imagine that the top of the chart is in black and the bottom of the chart is in red. Now, when Wolf Jarvis put together this model several decades ago, he was following the financial convention of, consult, uh, of accountants. So, black ink is good news. Red ink is bad news. In businesses, if you say, I'm in the red, that means you're losing money. Okay? In businesses, if you say, oh, we're totally in the black right now, that means you're making money. So, you notice that the convention I follow is I use black ink to talk about good things, and I use red ink to talk about bad things. Okay? Now, for those of us who are Asians, this is a little backward, right? Because for Vietnamese, you know, if you're gambling, and so off means you're winning. And so then means you're losing. So I'm going to ask you to sort of indulge me for a moment and really think sort of the Western way. Okay? Uh, but I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to use the terminology of being in the red or in the black. I'm going to call it being in the light and being in the dark. At the top of the chart, I'm in the light, and at the bottom, I'm in the dark, the dark side. You know, Obi Wan and Obi. Okay. So this is about human energy. How do we get energy into our body, by the way? Food, drink, and well, when we sleep, we conserve energy, but we don't get energy in unless we have an IV hooked up to us when we're sleeping, right? But that's it. Food, drink, and having the sunshine on our body, that's how we absorb energy. But animals have instincts, pre-programmed instincts, to tell them how to use that energy. We don't. We can decide how to use our energy. And this is how we can allocate our energy. At the top of the chart, if I if my energy is in the light, I am created and constructed. And when I have all that light energy in me, I'm moving to and with, and I'm open, like this. At the bottom of the chart, my energies are said to be disruptive and destructive. I'm moving away and against. And I am defensive, like that. Okay? In the middle is a condition called ambivalent. And ambivalent is when half of me wants to move to and with, and the other half wants to move away and against. I talked recently to an executive, he's probably around early 40, he's the vice president of a container shipping company, and we were talking about business, and he's very happy with the conversation. And he said, do you mind if I tell you something about my marriage? And I said, I'm not a marriage counselor, but, you know, this is your time, you can say whatever you need to. And he said, uh, you know, I've been married for the last 20 years. And in 18 of those years, I have been ambivalent about my marriage. And I've got a mental picture that half of him wants to leave. And the other half wants to stay, and he can't decide. So it happened half. He's not completely dead. For his, for his now, the five columns you have there represent the five psychological stages of development for a human being. Column one, a newborn baby. Column two, an infant. Column three, a child. 
column four, adolescent, and column five, fully mature adult. Okay? So, a newborn baby, in order for that baby to enjoy being in the light, all he needs is to have his body feel comfortable and to be healthy. That's it. He doesn't need anything else. Nine or twelve months later, he becomes a young infant. At that stage, he knows, he can recognize the people close to him that he feels safe, secure, and trusting towards. And if a total stranger wants to hold him, he will cry, indicating feelings of insecurity, fear, anxiety, and also this is the stage where he learns anger and boredom. Okay. I have two boys, aged uh, now 16 and 13. And I miss the old days, you know, when they were just about 6 and 3. And at the end of the day, I'd come to the house, I'd come into the house from the garage, and there they are behind the door, they'd be saying, Daddy's home. Now, they're moving to and with, and they're open, so I know they're in the black about my coming home. They're in the light about my coming home. They're happy with that. Okay. So, now, column three. A child at that age, three, five, six, he'll show you something that he's done, like a finger paint at school, or a drawing or something. He'd say, what do you think of it? And is he asking me to be an art critic, do you think? What's he looking for? Approval, recognition, love. Oh, this is great work. Oh, you're so talented. This is nice, good effort, right? Because this is the beginning of their self-confidence. You and I also know how to drive that child into the red, into the dark side and teach him hatred, disapproval, rejection, humiliation, and inferiority. How do you do that? What are some good techniques to drive a young child into the dark side? Yes, well this is not very good, is it? Well you shouldn't be painting outside of the line like this. How about comparing? Right? You're not as talented as the neighbor's kid. When I was your age, I was a lot better than you are now. Right? You and I know how to do that because we have seen plenty of examples of, pet, of bad parenting. We've also had bad teachers who know how to drive us into the dark side very easily. Column four, adolescent stage of maturity. I had a parent stand up in a seminar a few months ago and she said, red face, she said, I have discovered that the insanity is inherited. She said, you get it from your teenagers. <laughs> now, the reason teenage years are so difficult is because in column three, you get love from your elders, from your parents, your teachers, from the people you know, above you. In column four, self-esteem means you've got to learn to love yourself. And that can be hard if that is not recognized as a legitimate need. This is the stage where you develop loyalty to your own self-centered values. This is the way I like to dress. This is the way I like to keep my room. This is the way I like to use my money. This is who I like to have for friends. And these values are not necessarily the same as your parents' value. And it's so difficult because sometimes they don't know enough to let go, to let you develop your own values. Self-actualization is I am working on being the best person that I can be to maximize my potential as a separate human being. Self-actualization. Achieve. I want to do things well. I want to achieve. Accomplish. And then my self-confidence in column three now becomes faith in myself, which is a higher level of self-confidence. 
But if that is not successful, if I can't stay at the top of column four, I go into the dark side too. And the dark side is filled with self-rejection, self-disgust. I look at myself in the mirror and I can't stand the face in the mirror. I don't think I'm talented enough, or pretty enough, or athletic enough, or popular enough. And I'm disgusted with myself. And I feel great guilt about not living up to my parents' expectation. And I'm depressed and I feel like a failure. And lots and lots of very wonderful and talented people have experienced bottom of column four. For example, how do you and I know that Princess Diana spent some time at the bottom of column four when she was a teenager? And this feeling you know, lasted until she was in her early thirties. How do we know that she had it? Because for a young lady, this feeling at the bottom of column four sometimes shows up as eating disorders. And Princess Diana had plenty of it. She used to refer to herself as the ugly duckling, even though she was quite beautiful. Would it surprise you to know that many beautiful models consider themselves ugly? So, that's a very, very destructive place. And fortunately, many of us can grow out of it as we approach maturity in column five. At the top of column five, self-transcendence means I am able to rise above my own separateness. I'm able to commit myself to causes, to ideals, to other people that are quite important, sometimes even more important than my concept of myself. Meaning says, I can make sense out of the crazy and difficult adversities that happen in life. Like when bad things happen to good people. It was very hard to make sense out of that. But the sense of meaning is very, very important for a mature adult because I can make sense out of the stupid and crazy things that happen in life, the unfair things. Okay? Fulfillment says all the different aspects of my life work together very well. And hope says I believe tomorrow is going to be better than today. And I'm actively working hard to make that happen. But there are some mature adults who do not succeed in staying at the top of column five. Where do they go? Into the dark side. And the dark side is characterized by futility, which means what if I do makes no difference. I give up, you know. Apathy, I don't care. Despair, there's no hope. And cynicism, I don't believe in anything. Cynical people suffer from the worst type of energy in the entire universe. Their life is really dark and bleak. And even, you know, their attempts at humor, you know, cynical humor is very, very draining, right? So this is a very, very bad place for adults to end up in. Apathy, futility, despair, cynicism. And one thing about the model is this, and then uh, one last thing I want to say to you, and then I'm going to ask you to do a little exercise along the table. Okay. The higher columns contain the stronger energies. The more mature energies, the stronger energies. The more in the red you are, the more likely you are to be sick. In fact, there's not an illness that cannot be caused or accelerated by the dark energies, by the red energies. Okay. Um, in fact, if I'm already sick physically and my psychological energies are about column five, I'm much more likely to give up trying to live. Now, in all successful organizations, and in all effective adults, this is what I noticed. They are more than willing to volunteer to go into the red at the 
bottom of columns one and two. They even volunteer to do it. As long as they get three, four, and five in the black. So athletes are like that. Athletes, for example, talk about, you know, um, Lance Armstrong. Okay? Do you know how Lance Armstrong decides if he has had enough practice each day? He practices like seven or eight hours a day. Okay? And do you know how he decides it's time to stop practicing each day? When his body is in pain, that's when he stops. So he volunteers to have bodily pain. Okay? Now athletes, they go out on the field and they enter into a competition. They also volunteer to experience feelings of insecurity, anxiety, fear, and so forth. But they voluntarily have that because they believe they'll get three, four, and five on the light side. In other words, if I compete honestly and do my best, okay, my fans will show me love and approval and acceptance and recognition. I will feel better about myself as a person in column four. And if I win, I'll bring honor to my team. Right? I'll bring honor to my team. There'll be hope for the next time, and so on and so forth. And you see that happen all the time. None of you here is a parent yet, right? Anybody here as a parent? Yes. Okay. So parents will do this regularly. Parents will go without food or sleep because they will care for their child, right? And they will willingly suffer insecurity and anxiety over the well-being of their children because in column three, maybe my children someday will return my love. Column four, because I am a good person and my value system says that this is what a good parent does. And then column five, self-transcendence, means I love them. I'm committed to these people. I want their well-being to be even more important than my own sometimes. Okay? So, this is the model. I've explained enough to you. And so it's now your turn to do a little bit of work and report back to me. What I want you to do is work in the small group. And I want you to have this model in front of you. Okay. Have this model in front of you. And I'd like you just to have a quick conversation within the group for about 15 minutes. And what, when you're done, nominate a spokesperson for the group to report back the results. And what I will ask you to report is this. What are three things, events, or experiences that you tend to be in the black, in the light of that? Okay? In other words, what gets you to be at the top of those columns? What gives you meaning? What gives you self-transcendence? What gives you hope? What makes you feel self-esteem? What makes you accomplished? And tell me what columns your energy is in. Is it in column three, column four, or column five? Then I would also ask you to list three things, events or experiences, that you tend to be in the red or in the dark about. And you tend to go to the dark side. What tends to make you angry? What tends to make you cynical? What tends to make you depressed? What tends to make you feel rejected and humiliated? Okay? And then, what columns those feelings show up in? Okay? Have one small person report that. Then, pick the one issue that gives you the most red energy, the most dark energy and brainstorm looking for five tools, techniques, or strategies that can help you move from the dark into the light. This is actually the most important part of the exercise. You only have 15 minutes. You're probably going to need 10 minutes to do the third piece. So work quickly. All right? So 
you know, is it, uh, I don't know, is it the, uh, well, I'll just wait to hear from you. So I'm going to give you 15 minutes. Uh, right now it's uh, 3.20, right? So we'll resume at 3.35. Be ready with a spokesperson to report your findings. If you have a question, raise your hand and I'll come around and help you. I'm going to ask you just to list out the five, the three things that you're in the light about. Uh, three things? Yeah. Uh, be playful, be rewarded, and um, celebrate and enjoy patience. Okay, so when you're playing and when you're feeling like you get rewarded or if you're participating in some joyous occasions, those are things that actually put you in the black, right? Okay? Thank you. I'll come back to you. Who's speaking for this group here? All right. So what are the, the things that put your, your group in the black, in the light? Yeah, the, the, those three things. Okay. Oh, uh, you know, when we get married, yeah, yeah, there's a marriage. Um, and, and, oh yes, the, the, the Vietnamese New Year, that's a very joyous occasion. Yeah, yeah you know, winning a scholarship. Winning a scholarship, right? So, let me, uh, Go back to the bottom. Now, when I win a scholarship, in what columns do I have black energy? There's hope. Maybe there's a feeling that I make my parents proud or something like that. But then there's also lots of column four energy, right? Achievement, self confidence. So, so three, four, and five show up very well. Okay, uh, was there a group that was volunteering over here? Yeah. So we had food, which is one. Food! Five, four, and community service as top five. Yes, community service, absolutely. Team Magnet. Team Magnet, okay. Now, notice that food can actually cause somebody else to go into the red, right? It all depends, right? So you could be in the black about something and that same thing somebody else could be in the red about. Just like you were saying, getting married. So for somebody getting married is a joyous occasion, but somebody else may not feel happy about it. <laughs> okay, how about this group? What do you have to say about being in the life kinds of activities? Having family support. Yes. Being secure with a job at home. Feeling secure with a job at home. And yeah. then uh, getting the recognition for accomplishments. Yeah. So family support is what column? Two and three, right? Yeah. And then feeling good about a job at home, maybe security, column two, maybe column four, maybe there's some self-confidence involved in that, column three, right? And then being recognized for your accomplishments is what column? Yes, that maybe you feel good about yourself. Maybe you feel more self-confidence, that could be number three also. Okay, good. So let me kind of move over to this side kind of randomly. Anybody with their hands up? Why don't you talk about it? being in the light a little bit with us? Being around friends, cooking food for people. Yeah. Uh, deep conversations with your parents. What's the difference? Deep conversations with your parents. Oh, you're very fortunate. If you're able to have positive, profound conversations with your parents, 
most people don't know how to give constructive criticism. And so they tend to give very destructive criticism that make you feel really, really bad. Like bottom of column three, bottom of column four, maybe bottom of column two. All right. All right. So let me move way over here and ask this to you with the hand up. Let's, uh, let's hear about your in the dark kind of issues. Um, this would put us at the bottom of column of one, two, three, four, five. Wow. Becoming quadriplegic. <laughs> yes, and you know, you know some people like that. Recently, the world lost a great hero when um, when Christopher Reeve died, right? And Christopher Reeve had a C1, C2 break when he had the accident, horseback riding. And that break, uh, you know, created a total paralysis for him. Uh, and in his book, Still Me, he described his feelings about that. And this group was absolutely accurate. It's in the red all the way to the top, one through five. Because this is what he said to Dana Reed, his wife. He said, maybe we should let me go. What's he talking about? Yeah, give up a little bit, right? When people get to the bottom of column five, when they are in despair, when there's total cynicism, when they are totally apathetic, that's when they're likely to want to give up. Either give up a job, give up a relationship, or even give up their lives. Okay. That's the worst place for a mature human being to be in. Now, you know, Christopher was very fortunate in that he had Dana with him. And she, he gave her credit for saving him. How did she do that? Well, she said, you better listen to me, Christopher, and listen good, because I'm only going to say this once. She said, whether you live or die is up to you. But I have this to say. I have always loved you. I love you now, and I will always love you. And Christopher reported that at that moment, he felt some hope. And he was even able to make a joke about it. Later on, he reported to Barbara Walters in an interview that Dana Reed she played a trick on him. She said to him, look, why don't you try it for two years? Try to live with this condition for two years. And at the end of two years, if you still want to die, I will help you. And Christopher smiled when he said later, he said, I felt for the oldest trick in the book. It's the try it, you like it trick, right? Because once you've lived with anything for two years, why would you want to give it up? So it was quite a wonderful relationship that they had. So when an individual gets to the bottom of column five, he or she may need help from other people to get back into the black to get back into the light side, because the dark forces has total control over it. Did you guys talk about your, your dark issues yet? You did. How about this group? Yeah. Um, dealing with racism? Racism. Racism can put you at the bottom of column three, bottom of column two, and I hope it doesn't force you to go any higher than maybe column four, right? But dealing and, with racism. And uh, getting rejected by girls. Yeah, getting rejected by the opposite oh. gender. Yeah. And you know, that, that's free energy. Yeah, red energy in the bottom column three. The lower columns have less powerful energy. 
So when you want to go into the red, you want to go into the red in the lower column. When you want to go into the black in the light side, you want to go into the higher column. And it's kind of um, a very interesting thing about people. Okay, so let's talk about the five tools, techniques, or strategies. When you find yourself in the dark side, how do you pull yourself out? All right? So how about this group here? What did you discuss? Talking about it? Talking about it goes your room. Yeah. You have to make sure. Listen, everyone. Just talking about it with anybody doesn't necessarily help you, right? It's got to be somebody who has some skill involved in helping you deal with that. Like, at least they got to know how to listen. At least they got to be understanding, right? So you don't just pick anybody to talk to, right? You pick someone who can help you talk through this problem so you can feel better. Okay, what else? Uh, change of scenery. A change of scenery. Maybe, maybe helpful. Yeah. Okay, what else? Um, giving time, I, I guess, just let like, say like that happened. Yeah. Time. Yeah. So some issues may require time for healing, right? That there's a, a natural process that you go through that requires some time for the wound to heal. That's very wise. And what else? And um, mining for the simple mining. It's just, you know, a bad thing, not bad not bad you know, it's a good thing. Looking for the civil line, that is very, very wise. Do you, anyone seen the Chinese character for the word crisis recently? It's a, it's a compound character. It's got two smaller characters combined. Okay? The one on top says danger. What does the one on the bottom say? Opportunity. For thousands of years, that letter has been out there that says in a crisis you've got dangers and you've got opportunities. So it's wise to look for the opportunity in a situation, even though you're surrounded by danger, right? It's very wise. A anything else? Yeah. It's good. Good job. How about you guys? What are your five strategies? I think that uh, team magnetizing came up with um, a uh, uh, change of attitude, so being optimistic. Yeah. Um, so a change of attitude is an extremely reliable technique for dealing with hardship, right? And there's self-reflection, so listening to yourself. Yeah, listening to yourself in, in quiet reflection. We have mentoring others or we mentor. Interesting. So you're saying by helping other people through their difficulties, you're also forgetting your own trouble. Yes. Very good. Yes. And so these are things that can kind of absorb your energy, your creative energy. To, uh, to not isolate yourself, but to sort of allow yourself to bump into other people, you know, because there's, there's good support there. This, uh, this is a very, uh, very good list. Because you're Yes, it's because you're a team right now. Wow. So, anyone heard of Viktor Frankl? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Frankl wrote the book Man's Search for Meaning to tell about his experience in the death camps in World War II because he was a Jewish person. And he talked about how important it is when bad things happen to good people. Uh, if you keep asking, why is this happening to me? you're not likely to be able to come up with a good answer. In fact, you're likely to be even more frustrated. So he says a much better answer is, a much better question to ask is, what is life demanding of me in this situation? Okay? And that's a change of attitude. Okay? 
So I'm a good person. This bad stuff has happened to me. What is life demanding me to do? Friends say, you know, why is this happening to me? I'm a good person. This is terrible. Well, that's just going to depress you more. Right? Now, the strategy of helping others is a very, very well-known strategy. It is self-transcendent. When Victor Frankl went to Australia to work with Will Jarvis, Will Jarvis gave him an Australian boomerang. And Victor Frankl used the analogy of the boomerang to discuss self-transcendence. He says, do you know that when the boomerang returns to the thrower, it is because it has failed in its primary purpose? If the boomerang has been thrown successfully, it would hit its target and it would fall where the target is. It would not return to the thrower. So he says, a human being who is obsessed and self-centered, obsessed with himself and centered upon himself, is an individual who has failed to find some cause in the world or someone to love, to help, to serve. Okay? So he said, uh, I go back to column four and the lower column only when I have been frustrated in finding someone to love, some cause to be of service to, or some uh, project or, or a masterpiece to be uh, created in. So that's a, that's a very, very nice uh, set of strategies there. Okay, we have time for maybe one more group. Do you guys like to talk about your strategies for getting out of the dark side? <laughs> Okay, for number one, we have uh, seek guidance and no medication. Yeah. Yeah. Gu guidance before medication, okay? In, in some cases, let, let's face it, there are situations that do benefit from medication, yeah? So, for example, not all depression is psychologically caused. There's, there's some depression that's caused by biochemical imbalances. And uh, it is perfectly acceptable to treat the disorder with biochemicals, medication. Okay. What else? Next one we have uh, exercise. Exercise. What is the chemical in exercises that makes you feel good? Endorphins, right? Right, so endorphin, because it is natural, is much more preferred to other forms of medication. Okay, what else? Um, yeah, surround or uh, something in the environment. Good. So maybe just changing the scene or surrounding yourself with a, you know, maybe more positive environment. And uh, something with that, like, if it happens, okay, it happens. You gotta move on. Why fight over things that are outside of your control? Accept the things that are not within your control. Focus your energy on things that are within your control. Anyone know the serenity prayer? What does the serenity prayer say? Yeah? What, what does it say? Accept the things that I cannot change. The serenity to accept a, no, no. I mean the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. The courage to change the things that I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Right? Okay. Now the fact that people live by the serenity prayer. The fact that people live by the serenity prayer, they don't waste time and energy obsessed with things that are outside of their control. They focus energy on the things that are. Okay, the last one we have is to communicate something can't hold it in. That's right. That's right. So let me let me share with you something. You know, like you, I also grew up 
in a Vietnamese family. Perhaps some of you, uh, you know, were born over here in the United States. But I, uh, I left Vietnam in 1970 when I was 17 years old. I came from a very poor family. My parents had nine children, and both my mom and dad, their highest level of education was about the fourth grade in elementary school. Okay. Uh, my father was a very humble public servant, and we never had enough money, and we had never had enough love to go around, and we were always anxious and fearful and angry. My mom and dad fought a lot. So it was a very, very difficult environment. And one of the things I noticed when I became an executive, when I started to manage people, was that I had a problem with anger. Okay? And I would, you know, with that temper sometimes would get a hold of me, and uh, I would see nothing but, but red. And, you know, my attitude, I would become very hostile, I would be willing to yell and scream and be really harsh with people and treat them like they're worthless. Okay? And in the world of leading people, that is a no-no. Okay? So, when I first started working on this problem at the age of 27, I had a teacher who gave me an assignment. He said, over the next six months, you are allowed to be angry only twice. And if you're angry more than twice in the next six months, you have failed. And I said, what are you talking about? Suppressing my anger? He says, no, that's very dangerous. He says, I'm talking about not even having the anger. Okay? And it took a while, but it worked. I still have the, the, the feeling that shows up sometimes, like I want to get angry. And the moment I notice that feeling, there's a mental shift inside of me. Something happens. So, for example, one of the techniques may be, they didn't do this on purpose. Okay? Or, uh, another technique could be uh, to imagine, you know, here's an interesting one. Alright? You guys all drive, right? Yeah, you have driver's license, you, you do that car, right? Do you ever notice that when I cut in front of someone on the freeway, it is because I have a perfectly legitimate reason? But if somebody else cuts in front of me, it is because they are an insensitive jerk. Notice that? You know what we call that phenomenon? It's called the attribution error. Which is the error that we have, that we commit, where we tend to attribute negative motives to other people's behavior because we don't know their motive. So we tend to attribute, I bet you he's doing this because he's just an insensitive jerk. Okay? But when I do it, I know my motive is because I'm late for class. I'm late for an important meeting because uh, I have so much to do today, and I'm under a lot of stress. I have a positive motive for doing those things. So I don't judge myself as harshly. Okay? So that's another technique I use to manage anger. And the technique is, I imagine that person doing what they have done for a very positive motive. Okay? So, these are wonderful techniques. Thank you very much. So, what we've talked about is this. Being in the light is good, being in the dark is bad for you. It's bad for your health to be in the dark side. It's bad for your relationships to be in the dark side. I have a client, I just met with him yesterday, uh, sort of on an emergency basis at the uh, Waters bookstore, uh, to have a cup of coffee, because he wanted to talk about the problem that he's having with his girlfriend domestic partner. Apparently she's very beautiful, and she has many 
positive qualities. The only problem is she has this temper that seizes her, that grabs her, and she becomes this monster whenever she is angry. And he doesn't know what to do with it. Right? So, being in a life of being the dark is bad for you. It's bad for your health, it's bad for your relationship, it's bad for your leading effectiveness. Right? Yeah. That's right. We, as human beings, are never totally in the light, right? But we're talking about trying to minimize the amount of time we spend in the dark. We're also talking about not being stuck in the dark. Because there are people who are totally at the effect of their dark forces. There are bosses out there, and you, you know, if you haven't found out already, when you go to work, you'll find this out. There are bosses out there who rule by anger and by fear. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Right. Yeah. Yes, well, be, be very careful about using your anger. Uh, but I'm with you on the part about not letting the anger have you, but let, allowing you to have the anger. Right? Now, there are two things I can do with anger. One is, I can control the circumstances that can cause anger in me, or once I already have the anger, I can control my reaction to the anger. In other words, how many different types of muscles do we have in our bodies? Three. What are they? Smooth muscles, the cardiac muscle, and striated muscles, right? Now, yeah. now, the smooth muscles are also called the involuntary muscles, and the striated muscles are also called the voluntary muscles. Why are they called voluntary? Because you're supposed to be able to control them with your mind. So for me to say a curse word requires the use of some voluntary muscles, yes? For me to be abusive to you requires the use of voluntary muscles. For, you, for me to raise my hand to strike someone requires the use of voluntary muscles. For me to do this to someone on the freeway requires the use of voluntary muscles, yes? For me to shoplift at the local Walmart requires the use of voluntary muscles, right? For me to steal from you your wallet or whatever requires the use of my voluntary muscles. So, when I become an addict, and let's say I'm an alcoholic, which voluntary muscles have I lost control of? These. Right? I've lost control of these. Right? And if I am a wife abuser, which voluntary muscles have I lost control of? These. Okay? You with me? So, yeah. Either if you try not to have the dark energy, or if you can't help it, then you need to control your reaction to have it. So, looking back at your failures now for a moment, characteristics such as compassion, being passionate, having good people skills, composed, responsible, visionary, great speaker, consistent understanding, integrity, risk-taking, open-minded, outspoken, nurturing, resilient, motivated. Where did this person spend most of his or her time? In the red or in the black? In the light or in the dark? Absolutely in the light. Now, when you're taking a risk, does that make you feel slightly anxious or nervous? It does. So you, you, it is possible you can have lower column dark energies, but they don't dominate your whole person. Okay? 
And because your A leader spent most of his or her time in the positive light, how did that impact you? Looking at those feelings now, being grateful, admired, want to be more like that person, honored, respect, humble, awe, thankful, inspired, proud, feel welcome in their presence, feel positive, influenced, empowered, motivated, attracted. Does that also put you in the light? Isn't that interesting? They infected you with that positive energy. Now let's get back to the emotional virus. If I am a person living in the dark side most of the time, what can you predict about the future of my two boys? If I am a person who lived in the dark side most of the time, what can you predict about the future of my two boys? Yeah. It's a very simple thing, okay? Will Jarvis lives in Australia, and recently he did a study to compare the people who returned from World War II, the veterans from World War II, against the veterans from the Vietnam War. Guess which group of veterans has more alcoholism, more drug abuse, more domestic violence, more suicide? The Vietnam vets, why? Well, let's take a look. If you use this model, how would you explain? The more in the red, where in the red? Failure, because the Vietnam War, in the eyes of the Allied forces who fought in that war, was a loser. The World War II scenario was a victory. Okay? So, the people who returned from the Vietnam War were not greeted with take a take for rage. They were neglected, they were ignored, some of them were spat upon. They were called baby killers and all of that, you know. So yes, they have a lot of column four. What else? Where else do you get red energies in these people? Do they have their fellow countrymen shower them with love and respect? So they get rejected, right? Column three in the red. Okay. How about the purpose and meaning of the war? Was it ever very clear in World War II why we should enter World War II? It was totally clear. How about the Vietnam War in the United States, in Australia? It's a divided thing, right? So there's some cynicism maybe, right? Some, some futility, some apathy. That situation. So, if you have more red energy in these people, you're likely to have more health and problems. All right. Now, Rook Jarvis did a very simple exercise. He looked at the suicide rates of the male children of World War II veterans, and then he looked at the suicide rates of the male children of the Vietnam War veterans. Guess which group had the suicide rate three times the other group? The children, the male children of World Vietnam War veterans committed suicide three times more than the male children of World War II veterans. So how is it that if my father lived in the dark side a lot, that I also will tend to live in the dark side a lot? Direct influence, right? Direct influence. Okay. So this is very important stuff. Your A leader was in the black, in the light a lot, and as a result, when you thought about this person, you felt all these wonderful light energies. The Z leader. Apathetic, indifferent, unorganized, indecisive, stagnant, stubborn, judgmental, narrow-minded, arrogant, and manipulative, condescending, negative, unresourceful, hypocritical, domineering, and a wuss. <laughs> they lived in the red a lot, didn't they? 
They live in the back side a lot. And as a result, when you thought about them, you felt fear, demoralized, contempt, pity, bitter, disappointment, angry, neutral, abandoned. Only one positive feeling is you're glad that they're no longer in your life. But you also felt bloodlust, violated, hatred, shortchanged, and so forth. Lots of dark energies there as a result of the association with your zeal. Now, when the Z leader tried to be in the black, in the light, what column did you try did they try to be in? Because being arrogant is a type of self-confidence, isn't it? Okay. So let me share with you something that we discovered. Lots and lots of Z leaders actually believe they are A leaders. They actually hide themselves from the truth. There's a kind of a denial that's going on. There's a kind of pretense. You will rarely be able to get a Z leader to admit that they are a bad leader. Most of the time, they will actually pretend that they are a very good leader. And they have all the justification around that scenario to convince themselves that they're really good. Right? So, when I go into the dark side, however, today, I already told you about my background, my upbringing, and all of that, right? So when I go into the dark side today, who is responsible for me being in the dark side? Me? Is that always true? What do you think? Yeah? Yeah? Yeah, but I'm there bad things that happen to good people? Right? So I could be a very good person, I could live right, and I could be a very compassionate person, and I could be very kind and helpful to everybody else, and then, you know, I could be in an accident, I could find myself having cancer or some incurable disease, my second son could be born with an incurable illness and he would live to a, uh, an early death. Things like that do happen, don't they? So, like I said to you, when I go into the dark side, is it always my fault? Is it always my fault? Now, this is very crucial, because if you're not careful, you could be blaming yourself when you're being the victim. Be very careful about blaming the victim. You're a good person, bad things are happening to you, and here you're beating yourself up saying, you know, you jerk, you put this upon yourself, you go into the red on your own, and so forth. So, I would recommend to you a different belief. Because there's enough New Age philosophers out there saying I'm totally responsible for all the negativity in my life. I, I tend to question that. What I would recommend to you is this. You and I are not always completely responsible for all of the negativity that happens to us. But would you agree that we can take responsibility for what we do to remove that negativity from our life. Yeah? Just like Franco was saying, don't try to ask, why is this happening to me? Ask the question, now that it has happened to me, and being the good person that I am, what can I do to relieve the negativity? Okay? One more question. Why is it you think that there are some people out there in your life, in your world, in my life, in my world, who seem to be addicted to the dark side. Because there are a lot of them, right? There are bosses, there are coaches, there are parents, 
there are teachers who seem to sort of wallow in this negativity. So, because it is easier, and you don't have to try very hard, that's a good question. What else? Yes. So it's easy, it's comfortable. What else? Yeah. They, yeah, they don't know that it's that. It's like if a fish has been living in a tank of water that's very dirty, it doesn't know that it's, it's swimming in dirty water. It doesn't have the distinction called a clean tank. Right? So you have to take that fish and put it in a clean tank and then put it back in the dirty tank, and he says, whoa, this is dirty. Right? Okay, what else? There are some profound payoffs for people to be in the dark side. Notice, for example, when I'm maintaining a grudge against someone, am I always right? I'm never wrong. If I'm mad at you for a long, long time, it doesn't matter what, I'm still right. So notice that being right is one of the rewards that people rely on to stay in the dark side. That's why I have a saying for my clients, do you want to be right or do you want to be effective? Be very careful about being right. Okay, what else? What other rewards do I get? Let's say I'm a very cynical person. What payoff do I get for being very simple? I don't have to take any responsibility. Also, when I'm cynical, I don't have to take any risk. I'm never wrong. Right? I'm only taking risk when I'm hopeful and when I'm committed, because it may turn out that I'm wrong. I might get deceived. I might get cheated. Right? But if I'm cynical, I never cheat because I never take a chance with anyone. Right? How about this? What if I'm always a wuss, wimpy, weak, submissive, lacking confidence? What payoff do I get for being that way? There are benefits for doing that, you know, short term benefits, like. What are the rewards for people being a win? Huh? They avoid conflicts. What else? They don't need to try very hard because other people will come to their help. Yeah? What? Yeah, being a pushover, so that's easy, right? Yeah, but why be a pushover? Okay, but it's more than that. I mean, that's like that's like an excuse sometimes. Yeah, that's also another excuse. But what it's really what I'm looking for is the payoff that people get for yeah to get somebody else to do the hard stuff. You see, so be aware that there's all these seductions for the dark side. And so, I, let me just wrap up because the organizers are about to jump on me. Okay? So we talked about the light energies and the dark energies. Okay? And you now have the distinction between the two different types. And you can distinguish those energies inside of you that's light versus dark. You also have some practice at recognizing the dark energy and taking actions. And you talked about some very powerful actions to bring back the light energies in you. Okay? And this, believe, believe it or not, is 80% of the leadership challenge. There's lots and lots of workshops and seminars you can go to learn on negotiating and communication and assertiveness and all of that. Uh, all of that is great, but it all depends on you first removing the dark energy and coming back into the light energy. And if you're doing all of those things from the light energies, you will be very successful. So my wish for you 
you is that, uh, uh, you know, as you go about in your work, in your life, once in a while, you know, somehow a bell will ring, and you say, oh, this is the dark energy that I'm being attracted to. Remember, we want to know, we said, there's power in the dark side. Okay, there's seduction in the dark side. Okay, and so in order to really be committed to the light side, it has to be a commitment. It has to be a very significant commitment. Because the dark side has this feeling. So my wish for you is once in a while you go through your life, a bell will ring and you say, wait a minute, I can make a shift. Wait a minute, I can choose in this situation to go from the light, to go back into the light rather than to react to what's happening in the dark. And uh, I wish that you would be very successful in doing this with yourself. This is the main task in personal leadership. And once that is successful, then everything else you put on top of that foundation will be very successful. Good luck, everyone.